Hey, Ryzen here. In this video, we are going to build an exciting feature for a productivity app using React, TypeScript, and Node.js. This feature enables users to create task factories that automatically generate new tasks based on specific cadence, like weekly or monthly intervals. While the source code for Increaser is in a private repository, you can find all the reusable components, hooks, and utilities in the Ryzen Kit GitHub repository. Before we jump into the code, let's understand why we need this feature and explore a high-level design of the system. Achieving any goal often hinges on consistently performing the right recurring actions. For example, maintaining a successful YouTube channel requires producing a video every week. Achieving a good physique demands daily exercise. Attaining financial independence involves monthly investments. The list goes on. To help users achieve their goals, we'll implement a system for recurring tasks in Increaser. Users can specify the activities they want to repeat, and Increaser will handle the rest by generating these activities automatically. Users can then focus solely on executing them. In our system, there is no direct concept of recurring tasks. Instead, we have task and task factory entities. When a user navigates to the Recurrent Tasks tab and creates a new item, they are actually creating a task factory. This task factory defines the rules for how new tasks will be automatically generated in our system. The task factory entity contains the following fields. An ID, which is a unique identifier for the task factory. The task template that will be generated. The cadence or frequency at which new tasks will be generated and the last output at time step of the last generated task. To generate new tasks, we use the run task factories function. This function receives a user ID and begins by retrieving the necessary fields from the user's table, including task factories, time zone, and tasks. We represent time zone as an offset in minutes from UTC, which can be obtained by calling new date get time zone offset. Both tasks and task factories are represented as records, where the key is the ID of the entity. We use this format due to our choice of database, DynamoDB, which allows for more efficient update operations on specific fields within a record. Additionally, records are more convenient to work with since you can easily access values by their IDs. Next, we define arrays for the old tasks and the newly generated tasks. We then proceed by iterating over each task factory, generating new tasks when necessary. To do this, we first need to determine the start of the current cadence period. For example, if the cadence is set to a week, we need the timestamp of the start of the current week. The get cadence period start function matches the cadence to a specific function that calculates the start of the period. For most periods, we rely on the date PNS library, except for the workday cadence. For workday, the start would be the beginning of the current day or the start of Friday if it's a weekend. The match function is more elegant alternative to the switch statement, and you can find its implementation along with the convert duration function in the Ryzen Kit repository. The run task factories function will run on a server that is likely not in the same time zone as the user. Therefore, we need to convert the timestamps to the user's time zone. We achieve this using the inTimeZone function, which takes a timestamp and an offset in minutes and returns a timestamp in the specified time zone. For example, the start of the week on a European server will be the end of the week in the US. The inTimeZone function adjusts the timestamp to the target time zone, ensuring accuracy across different regions. Knowing the start of the period, we check it again the last output add field of the task factory. If the last output is after the start of the period, it means we have already generated the task and can skip this factory. Otherwise, we proceed to calculate the deadline for the new task, which would be the end of the current day in the user's time zone. In the future, it would be better to allow users to specify specific deadlines for each task factory instead of defaulting to the end of the current day. The getDeadlineAid function 
follow the same pattern as the get cadence period start using the match function to determine the deadline based on the tasks deadline type. Next, we need to calculate the order of the new task to place it at the end of the list. If you're curious about how task drag and drop is implemented in Inquisitor, you can check out the corresponding video linked in the description. With order in deadline it calculated, we create a new task object and add it to the generated task array. To recognize the generated tasks later, we set the factory ID field to the ID of the task factory. Finally, we check if there are any generated tasks. If there are, we update the user's task and task factories in the database. We use the record map function to iterate over record values and to record to convert an array to record. Both functions can be found in Resident Case repository. Now the question is where and when to execute the run task factories function. We choose to do it in the user state query function, which might seem like an unusual choice at first. However, it makes sense given the current stage of our application. We persist user state on the front end so we can afford longer user state queries without blocking the UI, making it unnoticeable to the user in most cases. This approach also prevents us from spamming the user's task list if they haven't been using the app for a while. Additionally, it saves us money by avoiding the need for a dedicated service for this feature. In the future, we might need to consider moving this logic to a dedicated process, but for now, there is no need to over-engineer it. We won't cover crude operations for tasks and task factories as they are pretty straightforward. If you're curious about how to seamlessly implement backends within a TypeScript monorepo, check out the corresponding video linked in the description. The only thing worth mentioning is that we need to handle the case where a user deletes a task factory. In such cases, we should also remove factory ID references from the generated tasks since they will no longer be valid. We choose this by running sung task factories dependent field after deleting a task factory. That's all for the backend part. Now let's move on to the front end. On the tasks page, we have four sections, tasks to do, tasks done, backlog, and recurrent tasks. We want to focus on the Manage Task Factories component, which is responsible for the Recurrent Task section. Here we first display an educational block that the user can dismiss. We then render a list of task factories and a component for adding new task factories. The Use Task Factories component takes the task factories record from the user state and orders them according to the cadence field so that the most frequent tasks are displayed first. The order function is a utility function that sorts an array of items based on a key and direction. You can find it in the Rising Kit repository. The active item ID provider holds the ID of the currently edited task factory. Having that ID in the context allows us to change the behavior of other items in the list. For example, it's useful in a drag and drop list where we want to disable dragging of the elements while one of them is being edited. To simplify the creation of such a straightforward state management, we use the getStateProvider setup helper from RisingKit. To avoid probe drilling, we use the current task factory provider to provide the current task factory to the task factory item component and children. We use the getValueProvider setup helper from RisingKit to create the provider in a hook. This helper is different from getStateProvider setup as it doesn't provide a setter function since we only need to read the value. The task factory item component compares the current task factory ID with the active item ID. If the current item is active, it renders the edit task factory from component. Otherwise, it renders the task factory item content component wrapped in a hoverable component. The hoverable component extend the hover effect outside the children boundaries using position offset. You can learn more about this effect in the corresponding video linked in the description. To display the content of the task factory item, we use the prefixed item frame component. This frame is useful for maintaining a consistent layout. For example, on this page, it's also used for the button that adds a proposal item, ensuring that the button's plus icon 
and text are aligned with the task factory emoji and name. You can find the prefix item frame component in the resin kit repository. Inside the frame, we place a flexbox row element containing the task name and its cadence. We display how often the task will be generated, then a pill shaped element that has a refresh icon at the beginning. We display the form for editing the task factory within a panel component from Ryzen Kit. This component applies pattern to its children and when used with the V section probe, separate them with a line. To support escape and enter key presses while disabling submission when the form is invalid, view the getForm props function. This function returns the on key down and on submit properties for the form element. Since the only required field for a task factory is its name, we don't need sophisticated validation. It's sufficient to check if the name is empty. To allow the user to delete, save, and exit the form, we use the edit delete form footer component. We render each button except the save button with the type attribute set to button to prevent form submission. The isDisable probe is used to disable the save button when the form is invalid. When it's disabled is a string, it serves as a tooltip for the button. We use most of the inputs from the task form, the only difference being the cadence input. The task cadence input component leverages the expandable selector component from Ryzen Kit to display a dropdown with available cadences. Both mutations make an optimistic update to the user's state to ensure a seamless experience. After that, they call the API to perceive the changes and finally pull the remote state. This is necessary because the changes might affect other parts of the app. Specifically, in the case of task factories, we might need to receive the newly generated tasks. The add task factory component leverages the opener and list add button components from Ryzen Kit to display the button that opened the form for creating a new task factory. The opener is a wrapper around useState that provides a more declarative way to manage the open state of a component. The list add button is a button built on top of the prefix item frame component we used earlier. In the create task factory form, we use similar principles and component as in the edit task factory form. To make the user experience more seamless, we again use the fix links and fix checklist functions that will remove any empty links or checklist items. That's it for today's video. If you have any questions or need further clarification, leave a comment below. Don't forget to check out the links in the description for more related videos. Thanks for watching and see you next time.